Okay, there is one one problem. We on Kali Tribune addressed always uh, something like on the margins of other subjects, and that's a subject that is uh, current today and very rarely addressed. And it's a, it's a, I would call it chronic problem in young people with articulation, especially in my experience uh, with articulation in writing. As something we talked about already. Now we are talking about it publicly. Um, my encounter with it, my first encounter with it was uh, uh, when I started working as a high school teacher. I, was, I, I myself was was very young at the time, in mid I was in mid twenties, uh, and it was a wonder to behold because I never seen anything like it before. Not a great fit for such a young man, but it was something particularly not 18, 19 years old, and even older, when you go to faculty level, who are fairly intelligent, fairly articulated uh, in their expression, fairly normal people, and when you uh, task, give them the task to write down what they told you, they are an... Uh, Yes, uh, or the young people who are unable to to uh, not only express themselves in writing, express their thoughts, they are unable to uh, construct sentences, uh, literary to construct uh, complex sentences, and they are completely aware of the problem when when you point it out to them, but they don't know uh, what it is about, <laughs> and I think this is one one of the uh, one of the Problems that is completely ignored uh, by, let's call them proper authorities, at least in my country, but I'm sure that this is something Europe-wide, if we are to talk about Europe. Uh, and I think that there are deep, uh, deep, uh, some deep causes to this. Uh, this is not uh, simply the matter of uh, not being uh, educated uh, enough or trained in writing from very young age. Uh, because I remember when I was a kid, um, most of the kids I know were not very much into reading and writing, yet they, when need be, they would be able to pull it off. So there is something uh, something that, that came with spirit of the age in the, I would say, late 90s, at least in Croatia, late 90s to, to, to early, early notice. Hmm. Yeah, so so I think this is this is very interesting subject, and very very rarely addressed. Uh, mm. Something definitely something we could we could try to to figure out. Yeah, and what was your experience, uh, Mihai? Uh, about what Branko said. Mm. Well, yes, I I think this is uh, something that which is starting to be seen, especially from uh, the generations which are um, coming uh, from behind, so to say. I know some people like this, and um, for me, uh, there is no question that uh, it is about uh, the, um, let's say, the the way, f both the way we communicate today and the way we we gather our so-called information, and uh, e even this information gathering is itself problematic. But uh, I pointed out, I think, on that comment, you know, on Branko's podcast, I pointed out uh, this phenomena this phenomenon of memes, you know, and how you you take whatever subject, you know, whatever topic, no matter how complex it is, and you put on a picture and uh, two lines of text in you, which you take it uh, into the region, probably, and uh, you get this impression that you understand everything that uh, there is to understand about this. So uh, that is a huge problem, and I think it, uh, it creates some uh, sort of mental patterns which are uh, very destructive in the long run. You know, because uh, even uh, even if you... I, I see this uh, especially with the reaction to this problem. The reaction is the same as uh, the thing it tries to combat. You know, you, you, they try to fight memes with other memes. You know, if, for example, Branko, I'm sure you have seen uh, this with the alt-right and uh, your experience mm -hmm. with this uh, this thing. Yes, the alt right, <clears throat> the alt right made the utmost of memes, 
And they even had some theories about memes. And you have a meme theory in military sense. I remember reading some documents some times ago about using memes as a mean of uh, psychological warfare. I wouldn't go too far and now go in some kind of, uh, of, of uh, analyzing that maybe uh, roots of this uh, meme uh, flood uh, on the internet is some, something that's coming from some uh, shadowy sources. I wouldn't go that way. Uh, but uh, I think that 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 memes uh, kind of like uh, do tail on uh, the very nature of internet and the intellectuality that is based on internet. Now, Mihai had one idea in one of his articles uh, that was on a completely different subject, but uh, it caught my eye, about reading. Uh, difference of reading the book that is a physical book and difference of reading a PDF document. So, uh, at the first glance, it should be the same thing. So you are reading, you are you are connecting sentences, finding meanings. It should be the same thing. But he argued, for instance, that it's not the same thing because the book and the PDF document are not the same thing. That is the very very materiality material construction is so different that probably the process of understanding would be completely different. I used to think, I wondered, was that because of the backlit text that it, and the d digital refresh rate that it affects different parts of your brain than if you're reading text off paper? You know, it's completely... You see, the thing is that when you handwrite, the parts of the brain that light up are completely different and much more complex than if you type. So if you read off a screen with the, you know, the refresh rate, etc., Perhaps the, tar the parts of the brain that are affected are completely different than when you read off a page. Well, like I said, I, I, I even heard of studies done about this. And uh, they said that it is a completely different effort to write by hand and to read a handwritten text than it is uh, to, write, to type something or to read something which has been typed. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are two, two different things. And... Uh, it, I even, be, of course, uh, th this is some uh, modern notion, but, uh, you know, the, the conclusion of that, tech, that those tests which were done, those experiments, that is that, uh, um, you know, it improves your IQ. I would say it, it perhaps develops further your mental capacities when uh, you write or you, you read a text uh, which was handwritten. Yeah, they say that, um, I've been reading some studies, they say that the actual writing the physical act of writing enables a thinking process. So, for example, including the word although in the middle of a sentence, for example, enables one to evolve an idea in the middle of a sentence, whereas not, not using conjunctions like and, if, but, although, and all those things like that means that thinking remains quite simplistic. And this is what they've actually found in education. Because what you were talking about earlier, Branko, about why did this happen? There was some indication I came across that it, it came from this idea of teaching language in this method called whole language, instead of going back to teaching the very basic building blocks of language like phonics, which became unfashionable because it involved r rote learning and um, strict instruction. So then instead, in the 70s and 80s, they began to introduce into education curriculums this idea of creativity and emotional self-expression. Oh. And so this actually meant that children kept journals and they, the idea was that they were to be allowed to express themselves. But because there was a complete absence of grammatical training, which we were also, we, we also missed some of it, you uh -huh. know, because it's been going on for 50 years. They uh -huh. have found that children are unable to, you know, with phonics, what you would do is say you were learning the word boat, you would actually learn b b o o o, and, uh -huh. and, and initially you're not actually learning a sense of meaning. You're learning the recognition oh, the of symbols, you know, uh -huh. and they have. They're actually beginning to find now, just in the very last few years, two or three years, 
that it's better to go back to the old strict grammatical teaching, which mm-hmm. which became despised because it was considered it inhibited children's freedom. Um, I think that's very interesting. Oh yes, it is. Uh, not only that, but uh, it, the problem is uh, what this points uh, out to me as an ex-teacher, and I was. Uh, Ah, oh, teaching was my vocation. I really took it seriously. What I understood is that uh, people who should be in charge of this are not even not even noticing this as a problem. And the moment when you would have to start to, to address this problem, this would mean reverting on a whole lot of stuff, of, of totally turning things around. And uh, this would mean completely uh, maybe even return to 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 a different kind of a bri- upbringing of children which is on the other hand very hard to achieve now because uh, children uh, are least of all formed in school everybody talks about how school is important and so on school is the the least thing that really really informs you makes you uh, grow up and I don't know how, how how this could be changed because you have we are all under under the programs of European Union. All our countries are to some to, uh, to some extent obliged to uh, live up to those European Union standards. Uh, those uh, those standards are going uh, to into complete opposite direction. Now, when you teach uh, children. Uh, something that they can't understand, but they have to know as yeah. a building box. You had to pl- pummel it into them. You do and, and you don't, because I did homeschool my children and I had to teach them all how to read. And actually, uh-huh. for some crazy reason, I have no idea how it ended up that way. I actually used the phonics method, which is the old fashioned method. So we used to use blackboards and magnetic letters and stuff like that. And I would, we would go through, you know, duh, duh, you know, all the, the sounds, you know, uh-huh. instead of this forming the, a creative idea of what does the word mean, you know, so it was quite a strict way. But because I think the, essential thing is you read with children from a very young age which i actually think people don't do anymore and when you read with children you have to put your hand underneath the word or your finger underneath the word and they have to follow it by sight like that and they hear the sounds and it's a much different thing than reading off a screen or mm-hmm. but i i understand what you're saying about the strictness that perhaps there has to be more strictness uh, uh, strictness in the widest sense because uh, discipline, they have to discipline themselves and kids cannot do that by themselves. Yeah. And this idea that, that a little child has to be uh, first and foremost given opportunity to express himself. They are not looking for expression, they are not looking uh, in, uh, to their parents to be their friends or their teachers to be their friends. Mm-hmm. I mean... Just for the record, I was never a strict teacher. I was famous for for not being strict, but that was because I was teacher of uh, uh, subjects that were not of prime importance for academic uh, curricula. They they were they were preparing themselves for faculties. So I I never wanted to 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 bludgeon philosophy or logic into my students when nobody will ask them about it afterwards. They had a lot of to do with mathematics and such things. And interestingly enough, uh, speaking of Croatian schools, from the this war of independence we had and, and, and this post-Yugoslavia, post-communism Croatia, uh, the co- quantity of curricula is always on increase. And the kids end up knowing less. This is something that always fascinated me. It's, it seems that there is some correlation there because they they uh, they push too much on them, and in some respect they expect of expect them to cover uh, all kinds of different disparate fields, but in the sense that they can uh, master this only by uh, teaching themselves to learn by heart things, not understanding, and they just forget it when they go further and uh, things like writing they don't teach them that 
because th this cannot be applied in this sense. Uh, the thing with writing is, and this is something that took me a long time to understand, in writing you are alone. So uh, it's not like conversation. It is a kind of conversation, but it is a conversation with yourself. And this is what uh, scared me when I understand this, that young people that are very, that can seem very self-confident, very pragmatic, have a huge problem of being alone by themselves. And one of the symptoms would be this inability to write. I think it, 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 it goes very deep. And this meme thing, I mean, uh, memes are, uh, the word meme, uh, I think that Dawkins came out with that term. This is, uh, this is uh, understood as some kind of mental virus. It is, it is a contradictory concept because he understood, uh, uh, as far as I understand that guy at all, uh, he, he considers uh, memes to have life in themselves, that they are some kind of creations that then go on and exist and uh, act like viruses, uh, which is nonsense because memes are not subsistent, they are not beings, though. those are pictures, images made by, by men with some words. But people understand them in that way and use them in that way. And uh, sure enough, uh, the idea is that they should infect you. You are not supposed to understand the meme. You are supposed to be infected by meme. <laughs> and uh, I'll try it, for instance, to use them to that effect. And uh, anyway, a lot of people around the Donald Trump campaign that were not strictly Donald Trump uh, campaign employees, but those mass of people that supported him uh, relied a lot of memes on, on memes. I don't really know that much about memes, but is it some, it's not something that's just used by the old right, is it? No, no, no. It is used on a general level in yeah. today's society, today internet-based society. And is it not meant to convey like an ironic, I know everything, sort of a, an idea? Well, uh, yes. Uh, f for example, I, I remember this uh, stupid meme. You know, I think it was at the beginning of memes when this phenomenon started. You know, it was about, uh, it was about Christianity. You know, it, it says that uh, Christianity is about a cosmic Jewish zombie who rescued a, or who by dying, rescued a woman who ate from a tree or something like this, you know. And uh, the conclusion was, made, makes perfect sense, you know. So with, uh, with a few lines, you, you, practically, you practically demolished, you know, 22,000 years of patristic tradition and uh, liturgies and so on. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it, it, you know, it, is, it comes from this attitude, you know. It, uh, we, we have evolved, we have gone past this, you know, we know everything. Uh, you cannot fool us today because uh, all the information is at our fingertips and I think this is where it is coming from, this, uh, this sort of attitude. Mm, that sort of attitude infects everything, doesn't it? Yes, uh, this is why I said that um, even, even those who are realizing this and are trying to, to get away from, uh, from this state of affairs, they are, um, they are having problems because uh, they themselves use the same uh, means to to try to escape and of course that uh, that is no real escape you're just uh, using the same thing but from a different uh, angle and uh, this doesn't uh, doesn't provide anything by that you mean using the same medium the, the internet not uh, i don't e i i don't mean necessarily the internet but uh, the same kind of attitude you know for for example uh, there are a lot of people, you know, who are uh, doing uh, stuff about religion on the internet. You know, they're writing, they're uh, speaking about this, and they themselves are uh, starting this sort of topic with the same kind of attitude, you know, with this all know-it-all attitude. You know, I have read everything, I know everything, you know, you cannot tell me that I'm wrong because I know I'm right, and uh, this, uh, this is, yes, of course, we, we have uh, one example me and Branko, whom uh, we know very close, but um, uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the internet itself, uh, the medium, no, I don't think it is a, a proper medium for, uh, for uh, some, uh, some of these uh, complex topics. You know, I, I don't think you can, pr you can do philosophy in a proper manner on the internet. 
know as much as you try to. It is not about your intentions and uh, not about uh, philosophy itself. It's, it is about the medium. I think uh, that the mediums are not uh, neutral. You know, the, it matters uh, through what you transmit something. You know, it is one, one thing to transmit something in person, you know, to talk to someone in person in the real presence, and a completely other thing to talk like we are talking right now on Skype, you know, of course, uh, besides the technical problems with the legs and the dropouts and so on. But even so, you know, it is, right now it seems like we are having, let's say, a personal conversation. You, We see each other on a screen, uh, we are talking, we, we hear each other in real time, but in reality, you know, there is always this plastic wall, you know, which is preventing a real personal communion in this sense. I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, yes, this is this is a thing, uh, and uh, uh, I think that if somebody chooses uh, to uh, relay knowledge uh, through internet, he has to pay a lot of attention uh, to preparation of what he is doing and what is the scope uh, that he can encompass with his work, because uh, one of the things that are uh, that are extremely well, how how should i say accommodating to internet are uh, these conspiracy theories mm -hmm. because conspiracy theories existed uh, long before the internet uh, but the problem is that the form of standard conspiracy theory is the form of uh, many elements tied up into perfect system that is that is completely explanatory and this is the holy grail of this networked knowledge because the idea is that knowledge is uh, a resultant of infinitesimal number of elements that all come together perfectly that function together that's a systemic knowledge whereas uh, knowledge in the sense of metaphysics and not only metaphysics but knowledge in general a real knowledge is always the relationship between a whole and the parts where the whole is in fact the first and the parts come later we as human beings uh, start learning partially but the thing we are learning is in itself one whole to, towards which we are trying we are trying to achieve it in some sense and there are even some moments maybe where you can when it can be disclosed to you for some reason, but not not by by efforts of learning. It cannot be, I think, done in that way. And Internet can give you an illusion that you are having this. It really can give you this illusion. And what fascinated me is how it responds to to your queries, not only in the sense that Google has good algorithms, but I noticed that people when they go down this path of uh, delusion that they somehow through their study realized what is going on in the world, why is it going on, uh, what are the causes of this even going thousands of years back, how they start to discover things uh, that uh, reinforce this belief of theirs. They start to, to find, the, the find the clues at every uh, at every corner and they call they, they tend to call it synchronicity sometimes and I think this is this is the epitome of delusion this is when you think that you climbed so high that you have a bird's view for instance on, on your own life or even on the history as a whole but in, in fact you are completely losing ground you are drowning in information it's possible that the algorithms which tend to become personally, they tend to become linked to our searches and our, mm -hmm. his, our internet history. It's possible that the algorithms are actually contributing to this idea of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. It's one level, uh, of course. This is this surface level, but I suspect this goes deeper. I cannot really explain it. It really, it really resembles some kind of black magic. I mean, I can't use any any more scientific word because, uh, let's say, rational word, because it it is uncanny. 
I think uncanny is the right word, word to describe it. And this is what people call, uh, what is called the reality tunnel. That is when you become enabled to see reality as structuring and f organizing itself around you mm -hmm. in correspondence to your inner states. Nevertheless, this is the illusion. And uh, this proves to be illusion uh, for people who, who, who experience this because they start to, for somebody looking from outside, it is obvious that they are, that they are losing ground. But I think at some terminal points, when people really go deep into this, uh, they, they go into complete mental, uh, mental disorder. But this mental disorder would not be uh, some kind of darkening of mind by uh, by not understanding any, uh, anything but darkening coming from overload of of consciousness of of information of overload of information and i think that uh, whereas you are right to say that that to a large extent uh, uh, search engines uh, do that this by their algorithms i think this goes even deeper and uh, uh, I would say uh, the cause uh, that deepens this is something that is not in technology but in men using technology. Something that was maybe provoked by this technology and empowered. Because this technology gives this urge an expression, this urge to overpower everything by your own uh, intellect, by your own, uh, mm, let's say, knowledge. Okay. And uh, this is a very hard to. Uh, I've wrote about it in 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 few instances. For instance, there was this uh, phenomenon uh, of alt uh, on the alt right. They had this kek, uh, this frog god uh, that I think that guy Jordan Peterson also likes. Uh, that was that was uncanny for me. Uh, they they had they 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 are convinced that, that they conjured uh, conjured the god that inaugurated uh, Donald Trump into office. Now I, I for myself I took this pretty seriously. I don't claim to understand something that worked there that is rather new phenomena which we don't still understand. It is not something you can. Uh, satisfactory explain in a, in a with these internet algorithms that those people are just deluded by internet they are deluded by something deeper hmm, i think i'm not quite fully grasping what you're saying i understand the desire you're saying that people have this desire to be like all powerful intellectually and that the internet gives them this scope to have a lot of information but I'm not exactly sure. Are you sort of suggesting like that the internet is like an extension of the human nervous system or something that No, I, I'm I'm saying that internet internet is a technology that uh gave people an opportunity to really uh delude uh, some people at least to really delude themselves into this all knowledge state that they are really understanding everything, that they are really uh, making the world correspond to their wishes. I think that internet is a, is a, is a, is a medium in which they invested their intention, their their effort, intellectual evolutional effort, and that this effort got this intention got locked into it. And I'm not I'm not thinking about nervous system. I'm not, I, I'm not thinking about uh, about it in the in the in the material categories. That's okay. what I want. Yeah. Because intention is not material. I don't consider intention to be material. It has it operates through body to some extent, but it is not the body in itself. I think the thing that got that gets imprisoned into this carousel of images and information is something that is deeper than our system that is that is the soul because the soul uh, would be uh, the capacity of man that can be projected that and uh, can reflect back into itself because it is not material and uh, in that sense uh, this thing i think goes deeper 
It goes deeper than uh, simply being on bad trip. Because when you're on bad trip, once you are cleansed, uh, you clean the acid from your system, you are bound to be okay if you don't overdo it. Uh, but once your will and, and your mind and, and all those uh, uh, powers that are, that are not, uh, that are not uh, physical got entrolled and trapped, what can you do then? Uh, because uh, something uh, your uh, your very uh, inner inner being is invaded uh, to some extent, and uh, because we can we don't know that much about this. That is, uh, I'm talking now about things uh, that are not object of science for for hundreds of years now, um, two or three hundred of years. Uh, we have to recur to means of understanding this to, let's say, to past, some past times, previous ages when those things were studied to a large extent, and to our own insight. But I think that, that this is very dangerous, dangerous thing. Uh, I, I, I saw to give you a, a example because this is getting a bit abstract. I, I saw people uh, being drowned into their own uh, uh, world image, image of the world they constructed. And uh, at, at some point, uh, this world image for them became completely real. They thought they have explanation for, for, for everything that is going on. And that was something that was obvious to me, for instance, when uh, Donald Trump won the election. Uh, there were people who thought that this is uh, this is the end times in some sense, but otherwise intelligent people. I'm not talking about uh, some uh, I don't know Christian dispensationalist from Southern US USA or something like that. But to that moment, normal people. But all of the sudden, they they got warped totally. And uh, this is something I think that that is a. a, a First thing, it, it is novel. I, I don't think this is uh, this is something that happened that could happen 20 years ago. So it's uh, it's a new phenomena. This is probably the reason why I am wrestling with concepts. I'm trying to understand it myself. I'm not sure what it is, but to sum it up, I'm not sure that it's merely uh, the question of internet algorithms predicting what you want. I think this goes deeper. And it is far deeper than technology. It's something that is in human being, in his soul. Hmm. Miha, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I I actually have been thinking about this while Branko was talking. Well, first to start off with a joke, you know, I think this all all these legs and dropouts are the result of some internet god being angered by our conversation here. Yeah. So he's trying to screw it up for us. Um, about this internet, uh, the internet is uh, of course also created by men. So uh, in this uh, in this sense, it must correspond to a certain part of his psyche, of uh, the individual psyche and the collective psyche as well. This uh, phenomena, like synchronicity, which uh, Pranko was talking about, for someone you know who was uh, a little bit involved with uh, the occult, with occultism. I can say that uh, there is a clear, um, not only analogy, but even an identity between this synchronicity, which is happening in these conspiracy theory circles, and certain, um, let's say, certain um, experiences and certain um, mentalities uh, which are present in occultism. I don't know. Uh, if you have been or uh, you knew people who are involved, uh, for example, with uh, the Tarot, the Tarot system. Mm -hmm. Now, the, there are things happening there which are, uh, like Branko said, very uncanny. And uh, it is this thing, you know, it, uh, for, uh, from a certain point of view, you get things out of it which uh, are totally real. But at the same time, you have, you all, always have this, um, let's say, um, underground um, current, this, uh, this small fat at the back of your mind, that something is not quite right there. You know, it is a combination between illusion and reality, and you're not really sure when, which is one. 
You know, you, you have uh, guys like uh, Alistair Crowley, for example. You know, some, some people call him a charlatan, others call him a genuine occultist, others call him something in between. No, I think he's uh, a combination of all. You know, he was also a charlatan, he was also an illusionist, and he was, he was also producing real, uh, real uh, phenomena by his uh, crafts. And, uh, I think that uh, this, uh, these things with the reality tunnel and, um, and the synchronicity that some people conjure up different theories and then um, go on to find evidence that uh, these theories are actually correct, this is, this is something which can also be found in occultism. You know, it is like uh, you go out uh, every day and you see a mirror of yourself and you, your life wherever you look. And also, uh, you, you start conjuring up all sorts of uh, weird ideas. For example, when I was involved in those circles, I, uh, I saw people which, I saw this guy who actually thought that by some uh, ritual of his, and he was very, very serious about this, that he, uh, how to say, he generated or uh, he started Armageddon. Uh, not Armageddon, sorry, it was uh, a Norse thing, uh, he started Ragnarok. <laughs> so he was convinced that he, that's yes, cool. the second I mentioned Ragnarok. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's, it's I'm good. not gonna say controversial words again. Okay. No, okay. But but you are going to have to start there just after the idea of this guy thought he was conjuring Ragnarok. No, don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, yes, that's one example. Another example was uh, this uh, this girl. You know, she was. Pretty messed up for, from what I gathered. But, uh, she, she thought that, uh, through a curse of hers, she caused this massive earthquake in New Zealand. You know, and, uh, I, I, of course, I'd never, uh, really gone that down, uh, this line so low. But, uh, you know, I, I, I had actually had a, a similar experience once with, you know, with the, um, uh, with uh, the Tarot, you know, with that uh, nuclear uh, explosion in Fukushima in 2011. You know, I thought I had uh, predicted that on that very day. Mm-hmm. And it was very weird. <laughs> you know, it was, it was definitely something not which I cannot call a coincidence, because I don't think there is such a thing as a coincidence, but uh, it was also something very uncanny. You know, it was, it was uh, the type of experience, you know, which... Um, just uh, just makes you feel amazed, but uh, it doesn't transform you in any way. You know, it is uh, it is not beneficial in any way for your being. You know, it is just like a show. You know, like a spectacle. Nothing uh, nothing of substance. And uh, I think this is what what is uh, I have made this parallel between this phenomena in occultism and uh, what is happening with these people who by googling online information and uh, unearthing all sorts of uh, material, they think that they are uh, doing this grand theory, you know, of history, of the universe, of uh, how things uh, are uh, are made and so on. So uh, it, it is, it is a, a thing, uh, I think, an area for a serious study, you know, this connection uh, between the internet and uh, whichever part of our uh, psyche it affects because uh, it is inevit- inevitable uh, whatever we create whatever we whatever idea we we invent it is also part of us because uh, we 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 never uh, start from scratch from nothing we cannot create out of nothing we create out of pre-existing material and those material sources are found both in the external world and in us you now we're putting something of ourselves in whatever we invent. So th- yeah. there is no surprise there.
uh, when you when you mention I do agree with Mihai on this uh, and I do think that this occult I uh, and uh, I mean I I downright written this that uh, I uh, do take seriously when those people say that they are practicing chaos magic and invoking the god <laughs> frog <laughs> uh, I take that uh, very seriously also and I think that this is this is the real delusion this is not delusion or illusion in the sense that they are fooling themselves but they are really creating insubstantial reality for themselves because you can have in something like insubstantial reality reality that only seems to be reality it all uh, depends on uh, what you understand to be reality i for myself don't think that reality is uh, uh, essentially a material kind of like system of material things that are related together i think that is my, uh, that it is something much deeper and uh, these people i think uh, managed to get themselves into a position uh, to create for themselves a kind of like movie in which they are living and this m m uh, let's call it movie or 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 kale kaleidoscope uh, uh, has a real influence on them and real influence on the things that happen in the world but nevertheless it is illusory because it is untrue it is not substantial it is empty and uh, what i was uh, try uh, meaning to say the most important thing this what mihai said the the point with meme with memes is that this occultist uh, <laughs> uh, experiments that kids used to do in 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 times before used to do with Ouija boards or tarot or such things are now happening on mass scale because in, uh, uh, they are doing it like mass uh, it's not five kids together trying to to throw tarot cards it's uh, thousands if not hundreds of thousands of internet users doing such thing and so it has a potential indeed this potential already had an effect of of uh, uh, sucking in a lot a lot of people so Sorry to interrupt you there but uh, i remember i told you something last year about that uh, thing Mandela effect uh -huh, know, yeah. uh, do you know Deirdre, this uh, this thing about I've Mandela I've heard of it like it, it changes what happened in the past or something is it yes you know it uh, how it started uh, some some woman I think who a blogger practically you know she was convinced that Mandela Nelson Mandela uh, died uh, somewhere in the 1980s and she was convinced that she saw funeral images with uh, from his funeral and so on and uh, then she was surprised that she that he just died in 2009 i think i i, I can remember but and uh, you know she she didn't think anything of this until she met other people who also had the same impression that Nelson Mandela died in the 1980s and they thought that they saw images from his funeral and um, all that uh, from this, you know, this uh, term was invented, the Mandela effect, uh, the theory being that uh, history is uh, changing uh, as we speak. So um, we remember some things and then find out that uh, the way they happened has changed. So not that we remember wrongly, but they themselves have changed. You know, it's like, I don't know, uh, you, you think you remember uh, that they discovered some new continent, and then you find out that uh, they, did, they didn't discover anything. But uh, it is not that you remembered wrongly that they discovered something. They really discovered and then this reality has changed and uh, we have a new history. But, uh, so this, uh, this idea, of course, is absurd. But um, this whole thing is exploded and I saw that, uh, you know, they did this for all kinds of trivial stuff. Like uh, they remember that the package for, for Kit Kat, the chocolate, you know, was different that uh, between kit and cat there was a dash, but now they see that there isn't. So uh, 
the the package has morphed uh, or they remember that uh, um, we are the champions from queen ended up uh, with a different line and you know it, it is just crazy <laughs> i saw this guy once uh, that he he was convinced that something was amiss because uh, he served some drink at a restaurant and then uh, one year later uh, they told him that they never had that drink on the menu <laughs> so it's funny i'm reminding me now this is could be completely off the wall but you know the hermetic principle of i don't know the word mentality or all is mind do you know that hermetic principle yes uh, yes all, all is mind and to a certain extent one could say that yes all is mind you know, just as you were saying earlier on, Branko, about the that you don't believe that everything is material, you know, and you were also talking about, Mihai, about how these experiences, these occult experiences are real, but they do ha happen, but they may not have the substance that we think that they have. But yes. then again, if you attribute mentally to them a bigger substance, then they actually do have substance, you know, in a way. Yeah. They do, uh, uh, I would only try to, to give it a precise definition. Uh, they act. They can act. They yeah. can influence. But th they are not substantial. Because by substantial, I mean uh, being real in unqualified sense. Because something can be real in qualified sense. For instance, a lie has some kind of reality. Mm. Uh for uh, uh, for instance, in Plato's dialogue, Sophist, you have uh, Micha is working on it right now, reading it. Uh, you have this attempt where Plato tries to demonstrate where Sophists are wrong, and Sophists were groups of people in ancient Greek in in times of Socrates and Plato that were traveling teachers. They were teachers of rhetorics. But their guiding principle was that you have to uh, teach people to argue well and win arguments uh, absolutely with no recurse to truth or false. It's only winning. Let's say uh, somewhat simplified definition. This is how Plato would define sophist. And Plato tries to demonstrate not how is it possible that everything is a lie. Or that something, or that lie can be sold as truth. But he tries to explain how the sophists pull off the trick that everything is truth. Because sophistic principle is that everything is equally true. And now Plato goes into this. And he, uh, to cut long story short, the idea is that lie is a saying for what is that it is not, or what is not to say that it is. If I say, for instance, that uh, nobody, ca uh, people listening to this uh, cannot see cannot see us, so I say, I don't know, Deidre is blonde, which is not true. Did I say nothing? Or did I say something? It is some kind of something. Elusive kind of something. I, I, I addressed something that is other than what is. Because the fact that is, is that you are not blonde. It's a brown head. And uh, uh, the lie or illusion would be uh, to heteron, Plato calls it, the other of the true. And uh, it has some kind of borrowed reality. Now, uh, this may seem a, a bit odd at the first sight, but it is not. This is what we deal in in everyday life, in fact. And we are always trying to, if we are in the pursuit of truth, if we are trying to be honest uh, in, 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 in very mundane things of everyday life, we are trying to, to always come to grips with what is. To say precisely about something, what is it? Is, is, is it this, what people are saying that it is? But this other thing that we call a lie, it is also some kind of being, but the being that kind of likes obfuscates. It has a borrowed uh, existence. It, it is a parasite on truth. Okay. This is illusion. Uh, so it is not completely unreal. 
Uh, and in this metaphysical sense, to put it, to lift it uh, a bit higher, uh, take Plato, Aristotle, to, to, to be academic uh, for, uh, for a second. Both of them uh, didn't consider reality to be physical uh, in the sense of matter as is understood today. Uh, some people who are not well versed in philosophy consider that Aristotle was a realist. Uh, he was a realist, but in a quite different sense uh, than materialist, but because his notion of matter is that matter is a, pass a pure passivity or pure possibility for form, what he calls eidos, and form in itself is the thing that is intelligible, that can be understood. So everything that can be conceived must be some kind of form. You can't have amorphous something. Okay. And this matter, in this, in this mentality, the pure matter would be a pure nothing. Uh, matter is, uh, dynamis. Uh, dynamis means potency, possibility. Okay. Uh, that's where we get the word, word dynamic. Although note this, this is very interesting thing. When I say that somebody is dynamic, do I mean that he is passive or active? What do you say? In the modern sense, we would say it is active, but uh, yeah. in reality, the origin of the word was opposite. Yes, original was opposite. In Aristotle, to be dynamis uh, is is possibility. And matter is always a possibility of form. Now, if you want to talk about what he called protehule, the first matter, the pure matter, that would be pure amorphous nothing. This is being without form. And uh, interesting, in our day and age, uh, uh, when we talk about reality, we mean precisely this. Uh, uh, this is not a uh, uh, kind of like a trick, a rhetorical trick I'm pulling here. We are really on the opposite opposite side, because uh, not we as a people, because human beings, in my opinion, have pretty well disposed mind. But uh, the the let's say academic notion or scientific notion moved into this direction, which is in fact uh, wrong. And uh, so uh, the the this meme magic, this uh, occultism, or this illusion shadow weaving, as I call it, that's Plato's terms, skiagraphia, that's drawing of shadow when you uh, draw some figure and want to add it illusion of third dimension, then you add shadow. That that's called skiagraphia in Greek. Uh, they are uh, in fact uh, they are trying to. What they would like to do, eventually, uh, and finally, would be to reform the world, or their world, in, in, in kind of like their own image. And in order to do this, you, uh, the world for you would be this pure matter. So, uh, idea that, that occultism or, or uh, such things has to do with anything spiritual is completely false, because it is uh, an attempt to sink into this pure, pure possibility of everything, pure passivity. And this is what matter, in fact, is. Matter is not the thing that is pushing back. When we hit our head against the wall, we know that the wall, uh, wall is material because of the heat. This is not the matter. This is just the form that is not well disposed to my head. Uh, matter is a different thing. And this kind of thinking and this illusion making in, is based on matter. And what is interesting, internet and in general digital technologies seem to be a stage where matter uh, seems to really appropriate this liquid form. So internet is completely material. Everything is matter on the on internet, but it is a subtle form of matter. I, I think of, of it more as ether. But can, I'm going to stop you there for one second because I'm going want to bring it back to the idea that, Miha, you shared some stories there about thinking that you foresaw or you predicted the Fukushima uh, disaster. Yeah. Now, 
one article that Branko wrote that I had difficulty with, and I still have difficulty with it, is about the synchronicity, you know, because you went into it. And I suppose synchronicity for all of us, for some crazy reason, and maybe it's the internet, blah, 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 has become something more important than perhaps it is, you know. But I have a lot of experiences that could qualify as synchronicity. For okay. example, I just want to give you two. Okay, but the first one is because I was just recently talking to a friend about this, right? Do you remember on 9-11, when 9-11 happened, I was actually in my house. I was teaching the children, but it was lunch break because it was 1.45 here when it happened at 8.45 there. And we had just finished lunch and I was cleaning the table and it was a radio program. We didn't actually have very much electricity in that house. We had no toilet or running water. It was a very primitive okay. house. But I had an old radio and the radio started to say a new show came on and on the radio, the man said, and now we're going to speak to a man who is abused by a priest. And I just dropped my cloth, turned around on my heels, slammed the button on the radio and I said out loud, no more bad news today. Mm -hmm. And that was by 30 seconds before those planes went into the, the towers. But I had made I made a conscious effort that whole day to listen to no radio to hear nothing and then my sister rang me that evening at 10 p.m and she just said to me well and i said well what and she said are you like the last person on earth to know anything mm -hmm. but i just thought it was interesting that 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 moment of d making a declaration happened mm -hmm. at that moment but that's only one story i wanted to tell you another story which i find mm -hmm. which i found stronger and it seems very occultic even though i'm not really an occultic, I not involved in any groups or anything like that. But like one time, a very long time ago, my oldest son is 28, so he's just a little bit younger than you, Mihai. I was in town teaching a yoga class to a group of actors. And as the last few moments of the class came, there was this slanted window beside me, beside my head. So I'm sitting cross-legged and this huge crow lands on the side of the window. The window is opened. And he's uh -huh. literally 18 inches away from my head. And he turns his eye towards me. And it was like a big, glassy black ball, uh -huh. you know. And I looked into the eye and I realized at that moment that something terrible was happening. And so I said a prayer, you know. I said, please, God, you know, I just prayed, right, that something, whatever was happening would be okay. And I drove home and I found my son on the couch. He was only about 10 or 12. And he had, at that moment, been drowning in a lake. But his friend somehow reached down his hand and drew him up. So I came home having experienced that far away from that happening and came home to find that it ha happened at the same time. And so it's very difficult to not see that there is some materiality or some reality in these experiences. Yeah, you know, the crow is a symbol of death anyway. I, I know that, yeah, the Morrigan. Yeah, the is, raven. The raven. And yeah. my, my husband's, my, my married name is the son, the servant of the raven, you know, so there is a, I, I know the connection. Yeah, you know, I think, I think, uh, I, I know what you're saying, but I think we should, uh, perhaps here differentiate between two, yes. two different phenomena. You know, one is, uh, they are at uh, the two different poles. So synchronicity is uh, the one which is uh, down below. And uh, there is uh, a different one, you know, at the top, at the North Pole, so to say, which uh, it is called in uh, in Greek, they term it Kairos, you know, which uh, has many meanings. You know, one of them is the right time. But it is uh, this moment when, um, let's say, a ray from above, from eternity, meets time, you know, meets the flow of time. So uh, it it may manifest in a different in different ways. One of them is uh, this receiving of signs, which uh, I think uh, that um, in this, uh, for example, in this experience you had with the raven, I think uh, that this this was a God-given sign, especially because uh, you know what, what your first impulse was to pray for uh, whatever was happening. So when uh, this effect takes place. No, I, I think uh, you, you can be pretty sure that uh, it was uh, something um, something not illusory, not um, not illusory in any sense, but uh, really uh, a divine, a divine send, a divine sending in this case. So uh, wh what I'm trying to say is that this uh, synchronicity, 
mimics it um let's say it parodies this thing of um divine let's say i i cannot say divine visitation because this has other connotation let's say th- this moment you know this moment moment of divine light when uh, you have uh, this um this profound intuition, this really profound intuition, this uh, luminous intuition into something uh, which transcends time. But this synchronicity, I think, and uh, Branko's article uh, helped me a bit uh, explain this uh, phenomenon. This uh, this uh, synchronicity is more like a mirror, mm-hmm. you know, which you you project upon the world. It's a mirror image of yourself. You project about your surroundings, about the things surrounding you. You know, it is um, it is uh, this sort of exercise that I think Carl Jung proposed and many occultist groups have, you know, to treat your day, to go about your day as if everything you saw is uh, like a dream, as if you are living in a dream. And uh, whatever people you meet, whatever uh, circumstances uh, you, you experience during the day, they are like just uh, dream images of uh, your psyche, of different parts of your psyche. Of course, when you go out uh, living your day with this particular outlook, it is not very healthy because uh, in that moment you practically severe the connection between your fellow men and yourself. You no longer uh, regard them as persons, you know, as concrete persons whom, uh, whom are other from yourself, but you see the whole world as an emanation of yourself, of your, of your own psyche. So uh, in this in this case uh, the the things we uh, experience as synchronicity I think are just projections delusional projections which uh, seem to let's say to have a life of their own you know they like Branko said they uh, gain this borrowed reality you know you it is like projecting a movie on a screen in front of you and it seems like that uh, that uh, projection that image there has a life in its own, has some deepness, has uh, something which makes it real in itself. But it is not. Once you turn off the projector, uh, the the image goes away. And uh, the same in in this case, with synchronicity. It's reminding me, the conversation earlier on as well, and now this about... There's a word called paradalia, I think it's called, which is like pattern recognition. And the human brain is, is designed to recognize pattern recognition because... For example, even with foods and stuff like that, you know, in say, if we were in the wild, we need to pattern recognize. So in a sense, the the memes might be pattern recognition. The synchronicity might be just all forms of pattern recognition. Maybe. I don't know. Well, I... Yeah, Mikhail. No, no, no. Uh, I don't know what to say about this. Uh, Maybe it's... I'm not sure also because... uh, But uh, what you described, I I have... um, more or less nothing to add to what Mikhail said, that's what I think too. But what you experienced, this definitely different thing, yeah. Because I know my grandmother, grandma, God rest her soul, she had a lot of such, uh, such, such uh, events in her life, and my brother also, and I to some extent. Uh, but they are always uh, uh, related to something, uh, something uh, important. Uh, I remember my grandma when my father was a baby she just woke in the middle of the night took him from his bed and put him by her side after a minute the whole uh, part of the ceiling fell on that bed this is not synchronicity this is something else because yeah i just wanted to say that i have had so many of those exact same type of experiences like especially connected with my children you see Mm -hmm. Mm and and like my grandmother also, she was a tarot reader. <laughs> but, yeah, when you wrote about synchronicity, it really kind of made me feel, oh, God, like, have I been just going around projecting myself into the world in some kind of crazy way? But it didn't feel like that because they don't come invited, you know? It's not like... Yes. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in synchronicity, synchronicity, this term is just a mean uh, of trying to explain this. And it turns everything upside down because, I mean, Mihai more or less uh, summed it up 
what it is about. And it, it can give people an illusion when you read Carl Gustav Jung, who was a very intelligent man, and he himself was prone to such experiences. That, that's the reason why he got into it, but on, I think, extremely wrong assumptions. And uh, the the main the main thing is this misunderstanding uh, that that this is something uh, that we produce. No, we don't. This is this is the the, the crux of the thing. Especially, I mean, uh, somebody like Jung w- would not, or, or somebody who is uh, who is who is uh, ex- uh, accepting Jung's explanation would not go on and pray when something like that happens. You know. Uh, because uh, the idea uh, why he researched synchronicity was to empower it, to to create uh, some kind of what he called a creative imagination as a mean of uh, a, a, a method of psychoanalysis, of a method of curing mental illnesses. I think that by this method you can only cause mental illness and uh, mental. Mental illness in, in a, uh, not psychical, but really mental illness, uh, the deviation of mind, which is uh, very dangerous. So I think, uh, as Mihai said, we have to differentiate that. Uh, if I may add something, this, you know, and this is coming, you know, from uh, the experience of the many of the um, desert fathers, uh, the desert monks, I, I mean, and uh, also in the writings of the of many church fathers, especially from the east. Now you you have this um, you you always have this criteria, you know, uh, by which we can uh, differentiate between what is uh, authentic, authentic uh, a sign of a higher intervention of a higher experience, and what is uh, just a, a projection or a delusion or uh, something even worse than that. Now it is uh, like I said. It is always always about, um, uh, let's say, the effect it has on yourself. I mean, does it point uh, your um, your mind, or does it point you towards a direction higher than yourself? Does it uh, direct your thoughts to God? Does it create a feeling of humility inside you, or does it, uh, let's say, exacerbate the ego? Does it make you feel like uh, you are somehow controlling reality and that everything is about you? So, of course, I don't have to, to say that the first case is authentic, the second case, not. Mm. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I can give you one example. I won't go recounting uh, something that occurred, not happened, but occurred to me. It was a process uh, that was, out, let's say, out of ordinary. And uh, one thing that I noticed, uh, some time uh, have passed, after this event, that I cannot utter a cuss word. So I cannot, uh, you know, I cannot swear. I, I, I completely lost, and it lasted for, I can swear now, don't worry. But, <laughs> okay. Uh, but ne- never, never of God. Because Christ, when Christ swear, the first thing you'll swear on will be Jesus, will be God, will be Moses, or something like that. And that's because uh, people do believe in this, and then uh, you always swear when you're really angry, you hit on the thing that is most holy. But uh, uh, after that happened to me, I, 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 I noticed, uh, those are things you notice, those are not things that flash on you in an instance, but they are processed. I noticed I don't swear anymore. I can't. I, I can't bring myself to do this. And then by this, I realized this was something good. You know, and uh, this is how you discern those things. And you always take. Uh, they always take time. They are not. They are never an instant. Like you have this flash of insight. What they like to call mystical experience. Yeah. No, 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 no. It takes time. It takes germination. It takes time to understand and to occur to you. And it's very gentle. Because I think everything that comes from above, to use this term, uh, comes in this unassuming way. It is diffuse. It is, it is, it is uh, gentle, uh, like pervading you until you understand that you are completely uh, com- completely enthralled, enthralled by it, and it it never it never makes radical changes. 
but slow and subtle changes that you recognize only after some times. This is the, I think, this is how you can discern are you on the right path or not. Whereas in this synchronicity things, people want to have effects. People want to uh, make actions, do actions that will be to their benefit and not seldomly to others uh, and you have this in the in the now they are using it in politics, <laughs> trying to elect Trump, uh, Trump by 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 memeing him into into office. So, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, I wanted to say to to add something to what Branko said. Uh, well, sometimes it may have uh, this radical effect. It depends from case, uh, case to case, you know, I mean, uh, let's say a holy experience or something like this, but this usually only comes uh, for people who are uh, able, you know, to uphold such yeah. a radical uh, change. I but, have to uh, say that when I was about 35, I went from one day from being completely normal to the next day, my whole life absolutely ruined by anxiety disorder that came out of nowhere. And it spent the next 10 years ruining my life. For for no reason that I saw it, and it was an extremely physical experience, like hundreds, maybe even thousands of electrical shocks every single day, for which I didn't take any medication or anything, but it meant that I stayed in my house for five years without going outside, and I certainly didn't wish for anything like that to ever come. I never sought it, and but it did trans it it did transform me, you know. So um, some transformative things might be very unpleasant they, they might be uh, well, uh, I, when I said uh, when I was talking about gentleness that was only half of the story uh, that part you are talking about oh yeah that's that's a different thing that dark night of the soul uh, that, that's something different uh, uh, what I meant was the way how it uh, starts to influence you and this moment when uh, the some things in you get destroyed by it is extremely painful. That's a, a that's a different thing. I I I, I, w I was not meaning to 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 exclude it from from the story, but it just it just didn't occur to me to 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 note it. Well, uh, you know, the the thing is, of course, uh, I am trying to to speak not uh, you know from my own mind on this, but from, uh, from my own experiences as well as. Uh, from uh, from what I read in the Church Fathers, now this we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't equate uh, let's say uh, spiritual authentic I mean spiritual experience with um, what is pleasant. I mean uh, we should actually be more skeptical of pleasant experiences than of uh, moments of crisis because crisis you know it is uh, in Greek it means judgment. So uh, what? Uh, what I can say, or how how I understand the moment of crisis, is a moment when, uh, uh, let's say, the sh the light shines upon our lives, and uh, then it reveals whatever is um, authentic, whatever is built on solid ground, and uh, it also reveals uh, in this process the sand castles, and brings them down. And when you identify yourself with the sand castle, and that goes down. You know, it is like what you took for reality gets destroyed. So, of course, the experience is painful at that moment. And you experience it, you experience it as something uh, not at all pleasant. And you would wish you, you wouldn't go through that. But when you look back after some times, after some years maybe, you see that it was beneficial for you. Because uh, from there you could start to build on solid rock, to build on uh, um, a good structure. Because, uh, and, and this is a reality, you know, you, you cannot, life is suffering. You know, you, you must go through suffering in life. And in spiritual, in the spiritual life, of course, that is unavoidable because lots of our, uh, lots of the things we think about ourselves or, uh, the identity we project and uh, we say to us is our real self, it is, uh, it is just a pile of lies many times. So uh, when that gets destroyed, of course, uh, the first, uh, the first feeling you get out of that is one of a uh, deep pain. You know, it, it doesn't have to be something uh, related to, 
to let's say uh, external uh, circumstances others might not even notice about you a change you know you might uh, be able to put on a, a mask so you can function in everyday life but on the inside you you feel yourself torn apart and uh, I think we shouldn't regard that as something necessary evil or something necessary bad. More often than not, it is a it is a moment, like I said, of judgment through which we must go in order to purify ourselves from what is uh, from what is not true, from what is uh, from what is uh, bad in ourselves, in order to to be transformed for the better. I agree. Mm-hmm. Franco, you want to say something? No, no, no. I, there is not much I, I could add to that. I do, uh, you know, I, uh, that that I agree. One percent. To use uh, to use an image of what I said, you know, let's say you are traveling, uh, you know, towards a, a certain city, but you must travel by night. And uh, you are told to go through a very rough terrain uh, uh, to climb a cliff or something like this, a mountainous terrain. And you spend that night, you know, falling down and uh, injuring yourself many times, you know, and you, you maybe, during that darkness, you think, okay, why, why God sent me through this? I mean, I, I could have followed that really, uh, really... Easy road. Uh, Really, really easy road down there. You know, I saw that there was an easy road. Why do I have to, do I have to go through this? What was the sense? And then, you know, when the sun rises and uh, it is day once again, you easily see that below you that easy road was going for the precipice. And now you are really on the right path. You see the city in front of you. You know, everything, you know, all that, uh, all that uh, pain you experienced during the night vanished. So this is this is how it is. Uh, this is uh, from my from my of course limited experience. I, I cannot uh, boast of something great, but this is how uh, how I would put it into image. It's very useful. Yeah. Oh, you know uh, this thing, Mihai was saying. Uh, there is a in this Eastern post-communist Europe. Yeah. One might say uh, that whole peoples went through this. I can speak for Croatia, for instance, because I'm I'm of the generation that is between two worlds. So this old world of modernity that was communist in our country, and it was a federal country of six republics, broke up in a week. It was gone, and uh, I was I for one was was never brought up. Uh, I was not brought up in communist family. I was not brought up in family that had very much belief into this system that was idealizing itself, that was built upon myths, in fact. But, uh, nevertheless, that was my reality. And I realized this when it started to fall apart. Because everything that was built in communism, and this is really mysterious thing, falls apart. Some very good things, for instance, in Yugoslavia, occurred at that time. For instance, in music, in art, in, in the way the people lived. Because communism, once in power, it is extremely conservative. Because it cannot go nowhere. It is the economy that cannot progress or develop. And it's a political system that cannot reform itself. So they keep everything frozen. So... Whereas in, in Western Europe, you have this constant change that in the process destroys all forms of living. In communism, they stay preserved. And everything that was preserved by communism, touched by communism, falls apart. And this I think, is uh, sorry, yeah. I think the proper term would be, or more proper in my opinion, would be they are mummified, mummified during communism. Yeah. Can you, can you put it like that? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it. I, w I would rather call it frozen or frozen. Yeah, oh, it's the same thing. Actually. Maybe That's zombified, I mean. <laughs> because uh, we had an illusion of reality, in communism, not communist reality, but reality of, of even pre-communist times as were projected by communists, and when that fell apart, 
some people, me included, let's say, who were prone to look inside themselves, for better or for worse, started noticing that everything we held dear, almost everything, although I am not, I never, I, I was not brought up in a communist environment at all, uh, was completely insubstantial. And this is extremely painful. This is, uh, this is the trauma people are still passing through. Croatia is only now, only now walking out from this trauma. Because communism in itself uh, was uh, an attempt to make a break in history, and this break, and recreate everything anew. And their method was, the uh, main method of communist revolution is mass murder. And this is something they always try to give some uh, nice word to this, but it is based on killing, because you have to negate what was. They did this in Croatia on the pretext of killing fascists for a very short period of time because Yugoslav communism <laughs> softened up very quickly. Yugoslavia was famous as not being, you, you yourself, Didre, was in, in the 80s in Yugoslavia. It was not, so Romania was under Ceausescu, was much, much more hard line. Although also relatively independent, uh, both countries were independent and even hostile towards Soviet Union. And uh, for Yugoslavia, for Croatia, for instance, uh, the thing was that people had a feeling that they are leading normal life and that communists will just vanish because everything is normal, nobody is taking the party seriously, even the party itself. But it was not like that. Nothing was normal. It seemed normal. You could live, lead very normal life, happy life. But it was not. Something was wrong. And uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not so sure why. Uh, because it's incredible to me that everything that was created by that system, that everything that was essentially rooted in that system, no matter how good it was, just falls apart. This is something very mysterious about uh, precisely communism. And... Uh, as I said, this trauma of uh, bringing down sand castles is something that happened on the mass scale in Eastern Europe. Because everybody wanted to, to end communism. But deep, deep down, uh, they didn't never realize that they will be ending uh, uh, 50 years of their lives also. Mm. And this is... And then you see, then you see this even on, on, on socials, uh, so, uh, societal scale. So this is very interesting thing. So we East Europeans have this quirky mindset that is uh, that is uh, that is built from this kind. We kind of uh, saw how it looks like when all those illusions of modern times fall apart, kind of like Americans. I think experienced that with this 9/11. That was initial stage when their myths, things that kept them going. Yeah were broken, uh, were brought down uh, in, 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 in two hours. Yeah, and it's amazing how it was such a hugely symbolical act as well. You know, it was, you know, even <laughs> in that sense, it was almost an occult act. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, what a way for an illusion to crumble. What a way for a society to move into a post-traumatic stress dis disorder. Mm -hmm.